my words believe about Olaf Tryggvason, and here's how the rhyme revolves. That is the first verse of a song called the Ormer and Langi. There's a Faroese folk ballad that is um, all about the fall of one of Norway's most controversial kings, Olaf Tryggvason. And so uh, I, I tried to do, I, I wanted to do in a, a very abbreviated version of, I, I've sung the story, uh, I've sung the song in Faroese, I've told the story in English. I usually like to do both at the same time so you get a full idea of the whole uh, story. Uh, I have an opportunity to do that. It usually takes me a full hour, but I, I will try to condense it down to about 15 minutes. And uh, since it is uh, a Faroese traditional, it is done with a, a dance, a, a Faroese chain dance. So the chorus is translated as such. Rocks just dance in the hall, dance for meringue, gladly ride Norway's, when, uh, Norway's men to the Hildur thing, or war gathering. And in Faroese, it sounds like, it's kind of weird because I have to uh, have the English in front of me. Um, but it sounds like this. Uh, <laughs> no better than that one. So the, the, the song is called Ormer and Lange. Ormer and Lange translated means long serpent. It was the name of a great ship that Olaf Tryggvason had built. In fact, the song says, A ship was made in Norway's land, a goodly make was she. Seventy L's and four lengthwise, the keel from prow to stern. And that sounds ah, Grimmel the Harrow, the Nordic's land, they got to the Veroy Horn on their own, they sure to yally my feet or two. A dull and metal and stoy, but gleam or dance, so I hop lay down, sliding, lay a ruya Nordic's vented Hilda Ting. Now there is some historical conjecture because some people actually think that Ola Trickerson built one boat and found another earl that had a bigger boat than he is, and so he swiped that one and called that one the Urban Leg. Regardless, <laughs> he began a very wide campaign to convert all of he, the Norway, to Christianity. So, and the thing was, he was a very charismatic and well-spoken king. And he could convince uh, sometimes the most stardom of opposition to join with him in thought and deed. But there were some holdouts, and he converted them however necessary, which made him a few enemies in that, uh, in, in that campaign. So he needed to have a lot of force and a lot of sturdy guardsmen. His point man, one of his most trusted uh, guardsmen, was an 18-year-old guy that had been sent down him for Ringerich uh, by the name of Einar Thomas Gelfort, or Einar Thomas Shelley. Uh, Tambar means to stretch the bow. He was already one of the most accomplished archers in all of Norway at the time, and he, he was uh, set from Israel to serve the king. And so the song says, Here comes a man down from the hill with a sturdy bow in hand. The Jarl of Ringerich uh, has, sent, he has here sent me. Either you shall call me, well I can stretch the bow. Talk about a stretcher or height my manly bow for striving and shooting arrows. And hey, come out of the bed, Jay, oh, mommy, stash, oh, boy, in the yakker, in the ring, a rich, a hana, may he unsend, gleam or dance, so we up, lay down, sliding, glay, a new, ya, no, expensive, hilda, I am the skeleton now on the May of Balakambo, a spin a tambour, a chum and minchke boy, over a dreamer at then a dream or dawn, so I hope lay down, sliding, lay a ruya nor expense to hilting. Oh, I was very proud of this archer who was very accomplished at such a very young age. 
And so the song says, he brings him into a service. Listen here, young man, will you fare away with me? You shall be my champion error, the serpent, my longship to defend. Hoy to tell to unjemer to vif to vim me fare to escapire me noir vagash er orbor na for shara gli morgan so lay down sliding lay a ruvia nor expensive hilda hunting. They come down on the strand, doughty men and strong. The rails break and the earth shakes. They tug the ship from the shipyard. Jing you tie to strand alo marici men no rest alone no brust of on your own scout e goro vai che your own estegli mordan su io le dan sliding lay a ruia no rich men to hill da ching now Olaf along his campaign like I said before he had amassed many allies but also many enemies two of those deadliest of enemies were the Earl descendants of his rival that he killed off for the King of Norway, um, who were constantly plotting to take back the crown of Norway. They actually did not be able, uh, they did not um, get a plan fully together until they found an ally in uh, probably the, the grand orchestrator of Olaf Tregebson's demise. Not somebody that he had converted to, to Christianity, but a jilted ex-fiance. <laughs> as, so, as it falls true, so many times, times again in history, he was, you know, of course, the most eligible bachelor of the Norway. He was the king, he was the most eligible bachelor of the Norway. No, Norway. And to suit his courtship was uh, the sister of the king of Sweden. Her name was Sigrid. Sigrid the high-minded, they call in some circles. Sigrid the... Uh, uh, the obstinate in others. <laughs> Sigrid the Houty, meaning H A U G H T Y. A very uh, strong, very beautiful, and very intelligent and strong willed woman. And so there was a marriage proposal, and everything went off seemingly without a hitch until the negotiations come to a head when Olaf Trigvison demands of his betrothed that she must to convert to Christianity to wed him. This did not go over so good with Sigrid, although she responds uh, very uh, diplomatically and says, you know, I will not uh, turn away from the religion of my forefathers, but I will respect your Christianity if you will respect my, uh, uh, my religion, my heritage of my fathers. And Olaf didn't like that too much. He got disgruntled and got very grumpy. Slapped her with his glove and walked out. She did not take very kindly to that. <laughs> so when word came to her years later, after she had actually further been betrothed to the king of Denmark, who was Sven Forkbeard at the time, when she got more spotted from these earls who had found out that uh, she was uh, headed in for him, she, she spared no expense that, A, I will do you two, two better. I will form a... Uh, and I will convince my husband to form a force to gather with your force to ambush Olaf Tryggvason, and I will spend, send correspondence to my brother, the King of Sweden, to send a complementary force as well. A force threefold of Danes, Swedes, and Norwegians against King Olaf Tryggvason uh, when he is coming back from uh, one of his uh, incursions uh, to what they call Vinland, but it wasn't the Western Vinland, it was the Eastern Vinland, but they called Vinland instead. Uh, he was coming back, and he passed by an island called Svolder. And so the battle is joined at that point in time, and they call it the Battle of Svold. And so the battle is joined. Uh, the ships are all bound together with rope to uh, make a long platform, and against each other, they fight ship to ship. And first of the attacks are the Swedes. And they put up a very fierce attack. Olaf, with his mighty Ormond Lange and his forces, are able to repel the Swedes. And send them back to Sweden, and here's some insults to go with you. Says Olaf. And then it's the Danes' turn at the attack. And they are also a very fierce front to go against Olaf Tregevesen. And yet again, 
Olaf Tryggvason is triumphant and turns away the Danes and gives them insults to take back to Denmark. But then come the Norwegian Earls. And Olaf's force has already been besieged twice. He looks to his men and he says, Be on your guards, give your last breath. For these men are stout Norwegians like ourselves. And not those wimpy sweet routines. <laughs> You know, they often were a little bit uh, prejudiced back in the day. Uh, so, the battle is joined and the battle shifts. Olaf starts to lose ground. He starts to lose ships. They start to come off and come undone from his great platform. And Einar Tom Michelli, his most trusted archer, is standing on the bow of the Ormer and Lange, and he's firing arrows and dropping enemy soldiers all along uh, the enemy's platform. And he sees one of the earls, one of the earls um, that is vying for the, king of, uh, for the crown of Norway, sitting against a mast on a ship opposite of him. And he recognizes this and knows who he is. And so he thinks that if I were to just throw an arrow and hit Earl Eric, I could end this battle right now. And so he fires a total of three shots. The first shot whisks between Earl's Eric's legs and hits the stool that he's sitting on. He stands up upright out of surprise and looks around. And another arrow goes over his shoulder and into the mast, up to the fletching. <laughs> and at this point, he can track where it came from. And he sees this very tall man firing arrows directly in his direction. He grabs for his best archer. And he says, you see that big tall man on that ship? Hit him! <laughs> and so their archer, who is no slouch at all, draws back and looses an arrow, just as Eider is about to loose the killing shot. Because, you know, the first two are the leads. Those are the bead shots. But something unfortunate happens. And it says, and the song says, Eider drew a third time, meaning to strike the Jarl, then burst that string of sturdy steel, in the bow it seemed to break. I am a spin the tree, a send a yatala yatala rack a tam, rust on jure stone, jun spring, a bow on toga break a grim or dun, so yap lay da sliding, lay a ruga nor expensive hill a hearty. He didn't get that third shot off. He was not hit by an arrow, but the archer was good enough to hit his bow, and it breaks with an enormously loud sound. So much that the king says, All heard the king's the string snap, and the king said in wonder, What is making my ship rumble so dreadfully? Screamed back Einar Tomaschelli, casting the bow of his aside. That was the sound of Norway breaking from your hand. My king. I am the footstool, swear I ain't the tomb, a shadow in a castle, bow, a swing, no brass, no regu twin, I'm hung, I'm conquered, and hide a moon, gleam or dawn, so up, lay down, sliding, glay, and do ya know what he's been till he'll die. So the battle is now lost. Olaf Trigvison resigns. To his Darrowed face and fate, and he jumps off the ship into a cold, watery death, presumably. <coughs> or he is never heard from officially again. <laughs> Einar Tom Bichelli, with uh, his bow broken, throws it down. He grabs his sword and his shield, and he fights valiantly until he is beaten down by the enemy. But at the end of the battle, he is not killed. He is actually spared because the earls of Norway saw his valor in fighting, and his arrow ship with the bow, and being in the opposition. And, you know, since his king is dead, he's kind of a free agent at this point. <laughs> so he therefore makes friends with the earls. 
and he becomes a very, uh, a very trusted advisor to those earls and lives to a very old age, which is a very rare thing, <laughs> which is, I think that if there's an overall theme to this part of the song, it's don't be the guy, be the guy behind the guy. <laughs> And although this, this song is about 85 verses long, it has one left that I will sing for you, and it's the closing one, and it says, Now I will let up the song a while, I will recount not longer this time, so I shall take up the second tale, and it may be remembered far and wide. New skalepta yoia bikveya longur sinne dusna tamar armatot Konkulichuloi menne glimur dansot Hot lay down sliding, lay a ruya nor expensive hill.